graph algorithms is one of the most important uh, one of the most important uh, topics in, in uh, algorithms and uh, you are assumed to have seen graph algorithms so you are assumed to be familiar with uh, the basic graph algorithms graph representation and uh, graph traversal but we will go through them you know in this course uh, so that we make sure that we master the basics and we understand the basics of graph algorithms uh, with enough depth right so we we are interested in understanding graph algorithms with uh, sufficient depth so that we can understand the harder problems in uh, graph theory in fact you know when we get to np completeness np complete problems which are the harder problems many of the np complete problems are graph problems and we will not fully understand these uh, problems unless we have a very good understanding of graph algorithms in fact one of the most important objectives of this course is being able to distinguish between an easy graph uh, problem an easy graph algorithms problem and a hard graph problem it's it's being able to distinguish between an easy problem that has a, a well-known polynomial time solution and a graph problem that does not have a, a polynomial time solution so this is one of the uh, most important objectives uh, learning objectives uh, in this course so that's why we have to to build a very uh, strong foundation in uh, in graph algorithms now what's a graph so a graph is just you know, a number of nodes or vertices and edges so vertices the single is vertex plural is vertices vertices uh, or nodes node and nodes sometimes we will we will call them node or uh, nodes so we can we can we will be using nodes and vertices uh, interchangeably uh, in this course although you know people tend to use the, the word node more with trees so now what's the relation between a, a graph and a tree what's the relation between a graph and a tree and what's the difference between a graph and a tree doesn't a tree have a root node yeah so the the tree is a special case of a graph it's a special kind of a graph well it, it has a node if it's a rooted tree the tree does not have to be rooted but in a tree each node will have a single parent so if you have something like this this is a tree where each node has a single parent now if you just add an edge like this this is no longer a tree this is a general graph so the graph is more general than a tree so if you add this node in blue uh, this is no longer a tree this is a graph uh, or if you add a node like this then it's a uh, uh, it's no longer a, a tree it's a graph so the graph can be uh, directed or undirected so there are directed graphs and undirected graphs so these edges can have directions in some graphs they have directions and in other graphs they do not have directions we will show some examples in a in a minute and they could have weights so in some problems the graph the, the edges have weights and in other problems they do not have weights so that depends on the problem that we are trying to model or represent uh, by that graph 
So let's, to understand this, let's just go through some examples of problems that we can represent using graphs. So one problem is the uh, is a map. So a map can be represented or let's say street map. can be represented using a graph where the nodes or the vertices are locations, specific locations. Each node is a location. And the edges represent streets. So there could be a street from A, B, C, D. There is a street from A to B. but there may or may not be a, a street between B and A. So it could be one way. But between B and C, there is a, uh, you know, it's a two-way street. So between B and C, you have uh, a two-way street. Between A and B, there is a one-way street. Uh, you have a, a street between A and C, and between C and D, etc. Now, in this case, it makes sense for the streets to have weights, which are the, which represent the distances, or how, how long each street is. So this could be, uh, you know, it has a weight of five, which could be five kilometers or miles or whatever. Uh, you know, this is six, and uh, in the other direction, it will be six or maybe 6.1. It, 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 it does not have to be exactly the same. Um, and this uh, you know, has a, a length of 10. The distance is 10. So in this case, nodes are locations, edges are streets, and the labels or the weights of the edges represent distances. Okay. So this is a weighted and directed graph. Weighted and directed. A graph may be uh, directed but not weighted. For example, a dependence graph dependence graph will be directed but not weighted, unweighted. A dependence graph can you know, represent, uh, you know, f uh, things that depend on each other, such as, for example, uh, the courses in a certain, uh, you know, curriculum or for degree requirements. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you can have in a computer science curriculum, uh, you can have a, a programming one course, then programming two, and then you can the uh, a course on data structures that depends on programming one and programming two, but data structure also requires a course in discrete math. And then you have a course on data structures. Usually there are multiple courses that depend on data structures, including um, you know database, um, operating systems. Um, algorithms, etc. So a graph can be used to represent dependencies. And when we represent dependencies, uh, the graph is directed because the direction indicates that programming one, uh, programming two depends on programming one, not the other way around. So here the, the direction has uh, significance because the problem that we're trying to represent is a directional problem and that's why the graph is directional okay uh, the graph could be unweighted so this is directed but unweighted directed and unweighted graph uh, the graph could be uh, 
undirected and unweighted. For example, uh, a social network. A graph re that represents a social network where the nodes in the graph are people. Well, yeah, people or in fact, it could be a social network or a computer network. Okay, so this is a social network where the vertices are people and the edges represent people connected on, say, Facebook. So A and B are friends on Facebook, uh, but B and C are not friends on Facebook. There is no edge. So there is an edge between two people if they are uh, friends on Facebook. Okay, so this can be, uh, in this case, uh, the graph that is used to represent this is uh, you know unweighted and undirected because it's undirected because if a is a friend of b then b is a friend of a this is the nature of the relation and uh, it's unweighted because we don't have the notion of you know the strength of the relation for example you know, so we're, we're saying you know that two people are either friends or not we're not saying that uh, we're not trying to represent different levels of friendship different strengths of friendship, okay? Okay, so these are examples for using graphs. So let's now uh, review uh, graph representations, how we represent graphs. So let's draw an example. A, B, C, D, and D. So this is a graph. Okay, so now what are the, the two, uh, the most common methods for representing a graph in, a, uh, in an algorithm or in a computer program? W-linked list, maybe? Okay, so the list is going to be part of this. Mm -hmm. So it's the adjacency list. So the ad there are two main uh, methods for representing graphs, adjacency lists, adjacency lists, and adjacency matrices. An adjacency list or an adjacency matrix. Okay, now what's the adjacency list? The adjacency list, you will have an array of vertices, and for each vertex, you will have a list of uh, neighbors, or a list of, uh, yeah, in this case, uh, yeah, a list of neighbors. Let's call them a list of neighbors or adjacent vertices. So, to make this concrete, this is very important, by the way, because all of the algorithms that we will be studying will depend on this, on these graph representations. So, the graph is going to be the input to the algorithm. So, you will have something like a, B, C, D. Oh, I, I used the vertex D twice, so this is going to be an E. Sorry, I used D twice. So I just discovered this. And this is E. Okay, so now what's the adjacency list of A? A has B, C, and D. So it has a list. C and D. This is the adjacency list of A. The adjacency list of B will have what? Mm. Empty. empty. So the adjacency list of B is empty. The adjacency list of C mm -hmm. will have B and E. 
B and E. The adjacency list of D will have C. And the adjacency list of E will be empty. So this is the adjacency list. Now, well, let's, let's do the adjacency matrix as well. So the adjacency matrix in this case is going to be a two-dimensional a two-dimensional array in which uh, there is a, a binary entry, 1 or 0, that indicates whether two vertices are neighbors or not. So to make it concrete, here's the adjacency matrix. So you'll have A, B, C, D, and E. And here you'll have A, B, C, D, and E. Oops. Okay. Now, the neighbors of A are B and C and D. So B, C, and D, we set that to 1, indicating that the neighbors of A are B, C, and D, and everything else is not a neighbor. For B, the neighbors of B are none, so everything is 0. The neighbors of C are B and E. The neighbors of D are C, or C is the only neighbor. And E doesn't have any neighbors. So this is the adjacency uh, matrix. Now, which representation is better? Matrix. Well, if one of them was better, then people would have used it and would have never needed the other one. Right? <laughs> so if one of them was clearly better than the other, then this would have been the only representation that people use all the time and we would have had no need for the other representation. So the fact that we have two representations implies that each one of them has advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so now in, uh, you know, the list, the adjacency list is good when you are in, an, in, a, in a graph algorithm, when you are interested in knowing all the neighbors of a given vertex. So if you are interested in knowing all the neighbors of a given vertex, for example, all the neighbors of D, in this case, I only have one neighbor. So if I'm interested in knowing all the neighbors of D, I can just traverse the list for D, and I will only traverse this only neighbor. But in order to get the same information in the adjacency matrix, what do I have to do? I have to go through the entire row. So this operation is going to be theta of n in uh, the adjacency matrix. In the adjacency matrix, in order to find the list of neighbors for a given vertex, there is no way of doing it except for, uh, without going through the, the entire row for that vertex. So it's going to be theta of n for every vertex, no matter how short the list, uh, the adjacency list for that vertex is. So this is an example of an operation that can be done more efficiently with an adjacency list than an adjacency matrix. Now, can you think of an operation that can be done more efficiently using an adjacency matrix? Yeah. If you were to update the neighbor um, using the matrix, it's very simple just to... Updating a neighbor? Uh, like if you were to give a new vertice, A or B. Okay, give a new edge, you mean? Yeah. Add a new edge? Add a new edge. That can be done faster. Okay, so adding an edge, well, in fact, no. Asymptotically, it's not going to be faster. Because if you want to add an edge between, say, uh, A and D, 
do we have an yeah we do not so we already have an edge between a say we want to add an edge between uh, b and c so in the adjacency matrix to add an edge between b and c uh, you know we will set this to uh, we will set this to one right um, well and this can be done in in theta of one time because by the way uh, in a in a representation of a graph you know we we draw these as uh, uh, vertex names in uh, using uh, letters but in an actual program in an actual implementation of a graph algorithm these will be numbers so vertices are going to be just numbers you know vertex 0 vertex 1 vertex 2 vertex 3 so this is just going to be an array and each vertex will just be will have a number here we just you know we use uh, uh, letters because they are more uh, convenient uh, anyway so so the the, the two-dimensional matrix is a matrix that is indexed by the vertex number so we can get uh, B and C we can get to this in theta of one time so this is fast theta of one but how to add how much will it cost us to add C to the adjacency list of B how much will it cost will it be uh, will it be more expensive no why not so how much time will it take you to add C to the adjacency list of B? Hmm? In this case, it is without one. It doesn't matter. Yeah, in general, yeah. Well, if you add a new node, it's going to be quicker to use a list. Yeah, so you just append it to the list. So you don't have the notion of order. So it's not, it's not an ordered list. The adjacency list is not an ordered list. So if you want to add a new neighbor, you just add it to the end of the list you don't have to traverse the list unless you have the you know the vertices ordered for some other reason but in this basic representation that we are describing to add a new neighbor so you just add it you just append it to the list so for and you know with every linked list of course you will always have a pointer to the head and a pointer to the tail right so, so to add a new neighbor you can add it to the head or to the tail again in theta of one time yeah well, it's gonna be more efficient to use a list if you don't say you're pulling in data and you don't know how many nodes you're going to need um yeah. the list is just going to be more efficient in that i think i was thinking in of terms of space you mean it's also yes. the space complexity to okay <laughs> so from yeah definitely f from spatial point of view this is definitely uh, using more space uh, even though there is some hidden uh, uh, space usage here in the adjacency list so there are some things that are hidden here what are what are we hiding in the uh, adjacency list representation that is more expensive than the adjacency matrix what there is something hidden that we're not showing here pointers. the pointers yeah exactly so each of these nodes is going to have a pointer and if it's a doubly linked list then it's going to have two pointers so there are some hidden there is a hidden spatial cost but in general when you have a graph like this by the way what do we call a graph that has uh, lots of uh, you know zeros in the adjacency matrix what do we call it Sparse. Yeah, so this is a sparse graph. So we have sparse graphs and dense graphs. Now, so w w a sparse graph is a graph that has lots of zeros. In other words, the graph that doesn't have lots of edges. So a, a graph that has lots of edges is a dense graph. A graph that has only a few edges is a sparse graph but not here that what you know the language that I'm using is imprecise so when I say a lot and a few this is imprecise I'm not giving an you know a precise mathematical definition of uh, sparse or dense or I'm not specifying a threshold 
for you know counting or classifying a graph as sparse or dense in fact there is no such standard threshold so uh, there is no threshold but sometimes it's very obvious however uh, a good uh, you know guideline for classifying a graph as sparse or dense is looking at the number of edges relative to the maximum number of edges that are possible in a given graph so let's now think about this uh, given a graph with uh, v vertices what's the maximum number of edges what's the maximum number of edges possible edges v factorial what's that v factorial v factorial v well have uh, not uh, the pathway so why v factorial we're not trying to order the vertices right so if we're trying to order the vertices the, the the number of different orderings permutations is v factorial but here we're not trying to order the vertices what's the maximum number of edges that you can have v times v minus one divided by two okay so v okay e is gonna be less than or equal v times v minus 1 divided by 2 now where did this come from v times v minus 1 divided by explain it to us uh, so you have v vertices and uh, so the first like if we're going to count them the first vertice is uh, tied to v minus 1 and the second vertice in order to not count the first vertex the second vertex would be attached to v minus 2. So each each one you count, you have to subtract one to account for the fact that it's already connected, if you're counting mm -hmm. all of them. Well, yes. So another way of stating this is the maximum number of vertices. If you have v vertices, each vertex can have at most v minus 1 edges because there are v minus 1 other vertices. So here we are not allowing self nodes, so uh, self uh, edges. So we're not allowing an edge like this. So we're only allowing edges that go to other vertices. And if there are V vertices, each one of them can have at most V minus one outgoing edges. Now, if, if the graph is undirected, then we shouldn't count the edge more than once. So in other words, if you have this, this is undirected, and these are all the possible edges. So if it's undirected, how many vertices we have? Four, and each one has three outgoing edges. So it's going to be four times three, but why do we divide by 2? Because we don't want to count the edge twice. When we do 4 times 3, we count each edge twice. We say, okay, each vertex has 3 edges, right? So now we said this has 3 edges, but we also counted that this has 3 edges. So we, we double counted this edge. So when you do 4 times 3 or V times V minus 1, you double count the edges and in order to uh, you know make up for that double counting or to avoid double counting you just divide by two because this will count the each edge twice so this is v times v minus one divided by two but what kind of graph does this apply to what kind of graph are we implying here so this formula is true for undirected yeah so it's if it's undirected if undirected while if it's directed what will the formula be double that. yeah exactly so we will in that case double counting will be correct because if we change this to 
a directed graph that has all possible edges, we will have something like this. So there will be indeed two different edges, okay, and so forth. So the directed will have double the number of edges. So E is going to be less than or equal V times V minus 1, if directed. Now, what do we call the graph that has all possible edges? So there is a, a name for a graph that has all possible edges. What do we call it? We call it complete graph, a complete graph. So a complete graph is a graph that has all possible edges. Now what's interesting here is, so a complete graph. A complete graph is a graph that has all possible edges. Now what's interesting about these two formulas is that whether it's directed or undirected, both of them are asymptotically, well, what's the relation between E and V asymptotically in both cases? What's the asymptotic relation between E and V? Oh, v squared. Yeah, E equals, in both cases, E equals O of V squared. Yeah. You know, in fact, for a complete graph, for a complete graph, E equals theta of V squared. So if it's theta of V squared, if E is of the same order, well, if it's complete, then E is of the same order as V squared, is of order V squared. Now, uh, our definition uh, of, a, of a sparse graph, or it's not, in fact, it's, it's not going to be a definition of a sparse graph, but when we analyze, when we analyze sparse graphs, we will assume that uh, for a sparse graph, for a sparse graph, we will assume, so this is not a standard definition, that E equals theta of V. So for a sparse graph, we will assume that E is of the same order as V. So if it's, if it's then if it's cl close to V squared, we will consider it dense. That's our definition. If it's close to V squared, we will consider it dense. With the ultimate or extreme case being a complete graph. And if it's close to V or less than V, we will count it as sparse. Okay? So you have that, you know, spectrum. You have that spectrum of graphs. So when you go in this direction, it's more dense. In this direction, it's more sparse. And the extreme case here is a complete graph. And what's the extreme case on the sparse edge of the spectrum? No, only vertices without edges, yeah. So this is the extreme case. So this is E equals zero, no edges at all. And this is E equals theta of V squared. So basically E ranges from zero to V squared. With the, you know, moderately uh, sparse uh, graph being something like this, so in this case, E equals theta of V. So this is moderately sparse. Okay, so this is the spectrum of graphs. Now the last question is, we mentioned one operation that is more efficient with adjacency lists, but we did not give an example of an operation that, is, that can be done more efficiently with adjacency matrices. Can you think of an operation that can be done more efficiently with adjacency matrices? Yeah. Problems kind of finding the shortest path. 
Uh, no, in fact, our shortest paths algorithm is going to use the uh, uh, adjacency list. Well, one operation that you can easily perform with the adjacency matrix is given two vertices, determine if they are neighbors or not. So I give you two vertices, X and Y, determine if X and Y are neighbors or not. Now, in the adjacency matrix, you can solve this in 